Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Knock knock, who's there? Lord of the Rings is awesome! So, let's look over one of cinema's greatest accomplishments by acknowledging its top 11 greatest downfalls. Why top 11? Stupid fact, homies. This is the top 11 dumbest Lord of the Rings moments. Number 11. Just letting Gandalf die. Yeah, kind of shocked nobody ever talks about this one. In the book, as well as in the animated movie, when Gandalf is facing the Balrog, the Balrog uses the whip to drag him down with him, causing Gandalf to shout, Fly, you fools, as he plunges to his death. Fly, you fools! But in Fellowship, he hangs onto the cliff, most likely trying to make the line more dramatic. Fly, you fools! But the question is, if he's hanging onto the cliff, why is everyone just looking at him? Nobody thinks to run over and actually pull him up. Go! Save him! He's right there! You still got time, you little idiots! No, I take it back. Frodo does! It's one of the few times he actually tries to take action. But what do they do? They hold him back! Why? There's no reason to! I suppose if you wanted to go out on a stretch, you could make the assumption that maybe the orcs are firing at them. But hell, if you're just going to stand there and look at him anyway, the very least you could do is be a moving target by walking forward and picking him up. But, uh-uh, Boromir is like, No, no, he's gone. Bullshit I am, I'm right here! He's never coming back. I haven't even left yet. We must move on without him. I can hear every word you're saying. Remember he told us to fly. Yes, fly forward and grab me, please. You will live forever in our hearts. I'd much rather live the real way. Our friend is gone. Oh, fuck this noise. Tell Bilbo I never liked him! No! It still makes no sense whatsoever. The only justification I can have for this is that, well, it did give us a cool intro to Two Towers. I mean, come on, that opening was awesome. Even if they did land in a giant lake and somehow ended up on top of a mountain. In fact, why were they concerned for him if he could survive a fall into a lake and yet still have the strength to walk up to the top of a mountain? Ah, I didn't pick this enough. Fly, you fools! Number 10. Those bajillion endings. Yeah, y'all knew this was coming. On the one hand, you can't blame these people for having an ending that goes on forever. I mean, it's wrapping up three very big, very long movies. Lots of characters and stories need closure. But that's not what I necessarily take issue with. What I take issue with is the fake outs. Every other second, it looks like the credits are about to roll. Instead, they keep the plot coming. At first, it looks like it's going to end with Sam and Frodo together on the volcano, but then it keeps going. Then it looks like it's going to end with them reuniting, but then it keeps going. Then it looks like it's going to end with them in Minas Tirith, but then it keeps going! And there's still five more endings on top of it! There's so many goddamn fade-outs in this film, you could confuse it for the ending of Clue! Here at the end of all things. of an old life. It doesn't help either that ending 1.2 looks a whole lot like a curtain call. Ladies and gentlemen, your Lord of the Rings players! Billy Boyd and Dominic Monaghan as Barry and Pippin. John Reese davies as Gimli. Orlando Bloom as Legolas. Viggo Morganson as Aragorn. Rudy as Sam. Big Scary Eyes as Frodo. And Sir Ian McKellen as the always enduring, always heartwarming Gandalf. Ah! That is fucking terrifying. Please don't show that again. Ah! By Jesus, that's gonna haunt my nightmares. Stop that. Now, for a lot of people, these several endings are a big complaint, but I put it pretty low on the list because, honestly, I actually do like the endings. 
I mean, yeah, there's too many and they fake you out too many times, but the actual endings themselves are very poignant and kind of touching. So on the whole, I can't be that angry at them. Maybe just a little angry. And a little terrified. <laughs> Number 9. Gimli's Idiot Moments. So again, when making an adaptation as big as Lord of the Rings, you can't go into quite as much detail as the books can. So a good chunk of the time, characters have to be simplified. Understandable enough. But good god, what did you do to Gimli? Ah, oh, yes, the dwarves that go swimming with little hairy women. At first, he started off okay. He was simple and emotional, but still had a sense of honor and dignity. Let them come. There is one dwarf yet in Moria who still draws props. But as the movies went on, he just got goofier. <coughs> And goofier. What do trees have to talk about except the consistency of squirrel droppings? And goofier. He went from being his own unique flavor of badass to just silly comic relief. You could have picked a better spot. I cannot jump the distance and have to touch me. Not the man! Even he seemed to realize that his whole race merely existed to get a chuckle out of the real heroes. It's true you don't see many dwarf women. And in fact, they're often mistaken for dwarf men. And this in turn has given rise to the belief that there are no dwarf women. And the dwarfs just bring out the poles in the ground. <laughs> don't believe me? Just watch this scene and tell me if the punchline music doesn't write itself. <laughs> that we would have to wait for a prequel to actually get a dignified dwarf character. But until that time, we only had Gimli as the dignified representation of the oh. dwarf. Oh. Salted pork. Thank God he had his badass moments in there too, because if not, I think this would be Middle Earth's interpretation of dwarf blackface. It's a little tight across the chest. <laughs> Salted pork. Number 8. Legolas's perfect moments. If one character can be too flawed, then another can be too perfect. Again, Legolas started out as a very precise, somewhat advanced hero in the first movie. But as the films went on, you started to wonder why he couldn't just fight this war himself. Look at this son of a bitch! While everyone's doing their best to fight off soldiers on ground... Legolas! Yeah, Aragorn's like, Hey Legolas, would you mind bringing down a five-story elephant? Come on, you can do that in your pointy-eared sleep! But the bizarre thing is, he can! Without even batting an eye! Is there even a bead of sweat on his forehead? <laughs> Struggle at Helm's Deep. At first, it looks like all the humans are gonna have to fight, but then look, they suddenly get an army of giant dinosaur elephant killers. This battle should be over in 10 minutes. Look at the scene from earlier. Their fighting skills seem too good to be true. Aha! Uh -huh, we knew they would come at us in descending order from left to right, resulting in this cool ass shot. Everything is coming up. Oh. But even with all these badasses on their side at Helm's Deep, even then Legolas has to show off by going shield surfing. I'm sure that was essential to taking out those five guys you could have just as easily killed walking down the stairs. Wow, oh my god, that was awesome. In fact, I'm surprised Legolas didn't just end this whole war in one foul swoop. He's so freaking perfect, I'm sure he could do it. Legolas, a great is spawning in Mordor. Fear not, my flawed mortal friend. I shall handle this. Like a motherfucking boss. Legolas, you're too good to be true. And that is precisely the problem. I'm the motherfucking team, 
That still only counts as one! Number seven. Those close-up shots. I've mentioned this before, how a lot of movies and shows back then felt they needed to get a lot of wide-angle close-up shots. This would be fine if the idea was to create an uncomfortable scenario, but for a while, it seems like a lot of directors did it just to be different and artsy. And here, it's no exception. While this decision did tone down big time in the other two movies, and thank God for that, we had to put up with quite a lot of it in Fellowship of the Ring. And don't get me wrong, sometimes it's called for, like this scene where Frodo's about to put the ring on at the Prancing Pony, which, by the way, might not be the best name for a place like this. I look at the atmosphere and I feel more... the decaying mule. But like I said, here it's supposed to be a little off and uncomfortable, so the close-ups work. But come on, when Bilbo is just talking normally, do we really need to be this close? Even when Gandalf is saying goodbye, look at that! You can count the wrinkles under his eyeballs! How would you like it if I filmed conversations like this? Hey, Malcolm, did you hear they might be getting a new judge for American Idol? Yeah, I heard they might be getting a new host, too. Oh, really? You mean they're getting rid of... what's his name? Yeah, what is that guy's name again? Is it Seacrest? Is he safe? I know we're supposed to feel close to the characters, but good god, we don't need to be this close. <sighs> Is it secret? Is it safe? Number six. Denethor. Just, just Denethor. If there's any character I think was more over the top simplified in these movies, it's this one. And I know a lot of you may disagree, but I got some serious issues with this guy. Everyone describes him as a Shakespearean villain, being very complex and very sympathetic. <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys saw that, but for me, I just saw a crazy asshole. The whole time he seems to have just two settings, extreme jerk or extreme nutball. Yeah, when he's not frowning or slobbering or shaking his head screaming, that leaves very little room to actually feel sorry for him which I'm told is the intention they were going for. You will not pick my gun from me! The line has ended! Condor is mine! Abandon your post! Leave my life! It looks like there was supposed to be a real tragic element to him. Like, he used to be a dignified steward and has gone mad with power. But there's just so little dignity you can see in this guy. And I know the idea is that he's supposed to have lost all his honor, but you're supposed to give some idea that there was some honor there to begin with. And you don't really get that. The only time the guy actually had sympathy from me was when he found out about Boromir's death, and, oddly enough, when Pippin is offering his services. Until my lord release me, or death. And I shall not forget it, nor fail to reward that which is given. He does actually seem thankful and somewhat kind in this brief moment. And I'm not saying we need a ton of that, but we just need more than what we got. But no, we need obvious symbolism to show that the decision-makers in their ivory towers don't understand the fragility of life. Mist and shadow, cloud and shade. If I wanted slurping disgustingness, I'd go watch more of Gimli. <coughs> Even his death seems over-the-top goofy. Just when they're about to give him something close to a remorseful moment, what do they do? Uh, uh, <gasps> what, 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 what? This isn't Lord of the Rings, it's a fucking itchy and scratchy cartoon. <laughs> All I gotta say is, if you were looking to create a sorrowful Shakespearean villain, my guess is you need a little bit more dignity than this. We'll be back in a bit. Until then, let the emotional weight of this scene sink in.
I'm not dead! There's a saying that nobody ever really dies in TV. That there's always a way to bring a popular character back. Well, the same definitely can be said for Lord of the Rings movies. First they think Gandalf is dead. Alleluia. Then they think Merry and Pippin are dead. Alleluia. Then they think Aragorn is dead. Alleluia. Then they think Frodo is dead. Alleluia. Good God, I thought the ending had too many fake outs. This is like a new world record. Hell, they probably cut this Mouth of Sauron scene from Return of the King because it was twice that they did a Frodo death fake out. I have a token I was bidden to show thee. Know that he suffered greatly at the hands of his host. We've done this. We've done this already. The whole spider killing him thing. It didn't fool us then, it isn't fooling us now. Honestly, we just want you to open your gates for a moment. I go last! That still only counts as one! reason Boromir never came back is because Sean Bean has it in his contract that he has to die in every single role that he's in. And stay dead! But everyone else? Eh, death is just a roadblock to pass. It's like they build up that no matter what, these characters are fucking invincible. Look at this, how many times do they throw themselves into an army of killers and never even come out with a scratch on them? The funniest is probably this one with Aragorn and Gimli. That is fucking ridiculous. This long line of killer monsters all being taken down by two men. One of them half the size of the rest of them. Even in the final climax, they know they have nothing to fear. Listen to how they talk. Certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? We've done this a million times. Even if we die, we're bound to bounce right back. Hell, we have an entire army of dead people. It's like having a cold. You're out of commission for a bit, but you come back swinging. Nothing like walking through the valley of the shadow of death when that valley is just the size of a thimble. That is fucking ridiculous. Number four. Arwen's life is now tied to the fate of the ring. Eh? Now, there's no doubt that Arwen's role has been expanded in the movies, and to be honest, I really don't mind. It's a bit of a sausage fest in here anyway, and hell, even the woman who does join the fight has to pretend she has a sausage. So having her do more stuff, I think, was a welcomed addition. But then we get this really weird nonsense. Arwen is dying. The light of the even star is failing. As Sauron's power grows, her strength wanes. Uh, how the hell did that happen? We get something about the light of Bruhaha that's now somehow tied to Sauron growing because I have no clue. It was made up for the movie, I guess, as a means to give Aragorn something else to fight for, or maybe keep her more out of the way so that their being reunited would mean more? I'm not sure what the intention was, but... Brother, does it make no sense. What is that light thing she gave up? If it makes her mortal, then how come none of the other mortal people in Middle-earth are dying? In fact, if it does make her mortal, then how come they were talking about how much it's gonna suck when she stays immortal in that other scene? In fact, hell, they made immortality look like such a bitch, she'd probably be welcoming death by this point! In most cases like this, you could say that it's explained in the book, but this was a new scene, and talked in very little detail about it. The more I think about it, maybe it would have been cooler if they wrote it that she went to fight with the rest of the army. She was originally filmed in the Helm's Deep battle until they edited her out. Wouldn't it be nice to give her a little bit more battle damage than a branch from a tree? Ooh, look at that scar! It shows she's tough and pushes on after battling prickly leaves! I don't know. If you're gonna expand the character, at least do it in a way that makes sense. Until then, look pretty, cry, and don't cut any hedges. Arwen's life is now tied to the fate of the ring. Eh? Number three. Sam and Frodo's gayness. Okay, now let me make one thing perfectly clear before anyone has a heart attack. If Sam and Frodo were actually gay in the story, I wouldn't care. Hell, it'd be cool. Maybe they'd be the first gay characters in fantasy. 
Chief. Openly gay, anyway. But that's not what bothers me. What bothers me is that the intention was not to show the power of love, it was meant to show the power of friendship. Having a friendship and being in love are two different things. There's the love you share for a person you have an attraction for and want to live the rest of your life with, but there's also the love for a determined person who will always have your back and be by your side. And the reason that bugs me is that this relationship, while I do believe unintentionally makes them look more romantic than friendly, is that it's obvious Tokyo wanted to show the strength of friendship, for reasons of nobility and caring rather than lust or romance. Lust and romance is fine, and we see it everywhere in big epic stories, but that's not what this is about. This is about two people who care for each other as the closest of companions. And truth be told, there's only a few popular stories I can think of that really dive into that. You don't often see two people of the same gender who give up their life for the other just for the reason of friendship. If it's opposite genders, pfft, fuck it, almost always hook up by the end of the story. So that's why I think it's more important that a friendship element was played up more than a romantic one. And again, I don't think it was intentional, but it's still hard to ignore that it comes off that way. And so much of that comes from just how friggin' lame these lines are. Let's just look at some of these scenes again. Frodo was really courageous, wasn't he, Dad? Yes, my boy. The most famousest of hobbits. And that's saying a lot. <laughs> You've left out one of the chief characters. Samwise the Brave. I want to hear more about Sam. Frodo wouldn't have got far without Sam. Now, Mr. Frodo, you shouldn't make fun. I was being serious. So was I. I'm just waiting for Gollum to roll his eyes and say, Oh Christ, just propose already! And even the friendship slash romance doesn't always make sense. Frodo sends Sam away because he thinks he ate the last of the Lambus bread. Fair enough, he's possessed by the rings and being manipulated by Gollum. But Sam actually starts to oblige until he makes this little discovery. What exactly is he supposed to realize there? So I didn't eat it! Wouldn't his return have been a lot more powerful if they didn't show this scene? If Sam just said, fuck it, he's my friend, I'm gonna go and fight for him anyway? That would have been a lot more noble. But no, he had to realize that he didn't eat the bread that he realized already he didn't eat. Huh? Like I said, I don't think it was intentional, but the more cheesy these scenes are played out, the more you can't help but think of a corny romantic novel. So you can't act surprised at the comparisons. And I think we all know there's plenty of those. Granted, at the end, the relationship does work. Sam gets married, Frodo goes on his own path, and they do share a connection you legitimately believe in. Just maybe you believe in it a little more than what was intended. I can't carry it for you. But I can Number two. Sara who? There is no doubt that the biggest fuck you to a character came when Saruman, the only human villain you have throughout any of these movies, was completely left out of Return of the King. What the hell? He doesn't even make an appearance, a wave goodbye, or anything. He just doesn't show up. This is the guy that was the center of the poster in the last film. You're a major villain second to only that giant eye thingy. And he doesn't even get a little wave goodbye? What a ripoff! Now, in one sense, you could make the argument that Sauron is really the villain, so you don't need to spend a ton of time with Saruman anyway. But there's two big problems with this. One, the excuse that they give is not to go after him. That he's too harmless now to do any real damage. Fucking what? Well, let's just have his head and be done with it. No. He has no power anymore. The filth of Saruman is washing away. Yeah, he's learned his lesson. I mean, come on, what are the chances of an ancient evil that we don't kill all the way possibly coming back and biting us in the- <laughs> That doesn't count, he's an eye! And second, they had a perfectly good scene of him shot and edited already! Yeah, if you go to the extended edition, it's right there, right at the very beginning. It ties up all loose ends. The connection between him and Grimer, a final send-off between him and Gandalf, and yes, they don't just ignore the big evil genius who could obviously cause trouble later. He's killed off. And in a pretty cool way, I might add. Oh. 
well, I'm sure he can survive that. Maybe not. I guess this scene was cut for time, which normally I would understand for a film this long. You don't want to overstay your welcome. But it's the second scene in the movie! Nobody's gonna be bored by the first few minutes! Really? Do you think anyone was gonna watch this and be like, Oh, this first two minutes isn't grabbing me. I'm sure the next three hours will be more eventful. God, if it's a time issue, why didn't you shorten one of the other kajillion endings that you had? That's where people started to bitch and moan. They didn't need to know every single detail that went on after the war was over. But we did need to know what happened to one of your biggest villains in the entire film series. Of course, we always want to see the bad guy get the short end of the stick in the end. But next time, try letting us actually see it. Because that short end of the stick can impale pretty nicely. Hey, Gandalf, do you still have that two-for-one coupon that could get you an extra life at the pearly gates? Sorry, I already used it. No crud. And the number one dumbest Lord of the Rings moment is... Those eagles that could have stopped everything. Everyone in the world brings it up, and of course, so am I. Why don't these creatures of awesomeness just fly over Mount Doom and drop the ring off themselves? It's obvious that if they wanted to win this war quickly and more logically, they would have used these damn things from the beginning. And every excuse that people throw out in terms of the movie never holds water. Oh, well, they're eagle gods who don't want to get involved in our world affairs. Well, that doesn't stop them from interfering one, two, and all three times in all of this. Well, they wouldn't be able to get very far. The evils of Mordor are just too great. Oh, I don't know. They made it to the gate. They seem to be fighting off those ring wraith things pretty good. And even if they didn't, you could have Gandalf night light reflect them off like he did before. He doesn't seem like Mordor has very many of those evil flying things. Well, much like Gandalf, they would have been tempted to use it themselves and become evil in the process. For what, a two-hour flight? If Frodo can resist for days on end, I think all the wise spirit gods can hold out as well. And shit, how the hell are they gonna put that ring on their claw anyway? Well, they stick out too much. A sneak attack makes much more sense in the grand scheme of things. Really? Because how many times do Sam and Frodo get spotted, captured, and injured? For every day it takes them to walk on foot, thousands of lives are probably being lost. Let's face it, people. It's only by pure fucking luck that this plan worked at all. Even Gandalf several times in the movie acknowledges this was probably the dumbest strategy they've ever come up with. I've sent him to his death. Oh, why the hell did I do this? I should have used the eagles. I think all of us know how the ending of this film really should have gone down. Let's go back to that scenario we demonstrated before. I have a token. I was Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go last. The dwarves say Merry Christmas, motherfucker. Whiskey. Even the series How It Should Have Ended gave their take on this. Well, that was incredibly easy. Yes, it was. Can you imagine what it would be like if we had walked the entire way? Don't be so. Oh my gosh, can you imagine that? <laughs> you can make up whatever excuse you want. You can say that some way or another, this was the right thing to do. But for me, this is by far the dumbest Lord of the Rings moment. Now let's count down the most awesome Lord of the Rings moments. Oh wait, we can't, because there's too fucking many! Despite these problems, and I'm sure even more that exist, it doesn't change the fact that Lord of the Rings is one of the best film trilogies of all time. It gave so much, it changed so much, and as much as we like to poke fun of it, there's still just too much to like about it. As for me, I'm off to partake in the ancient Middle-earth art of dwarf tipping. I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember, so you don't have to! Salted pork. Oh. I shall handle this. You missed.
Oh, here 